Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, uh, I'm Christian Osterman. I'm director of the European program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And on behalf of Lee Hamilton, I'd like to welcome you to the center. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this session on U.S.-Dutch relations in the post-1945 era. I'm particularly pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists here today, Ambassador Rene Jones-Bass, the Ambassador of the Netherlands to the United States, <coughs> Ambassador uh, Jerry Bremer, former U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands, uh, and of course, uh, Special Envoy Administrator to Iraq, uh, Professor Cornelis Van Minnen, to his right, uh, Director of the Roosevelt Study Center in Middleburg, and Professor of American History at Ghent University, and his two co-editors, Hans Krabendam, Assistant Director of the Roosevelt Study Center, and Professor Giles Scott Smith, Senior Researcher at the Roosevelt Study Center, <coughs> and Van der Beugel, Professor of Diplomatic History of Atlantic Cooperation at the University of Leiden. Very pleased to have you with us today. Though the focus of today's session will be on recent U.S.-Dutch relations. The meeting today, of course, is occasioned by this year's 400th anniversary of the arrival of Henry Hudson and his crew aboard the Dutch ship Half Moon in uh, what became New York Harbor in 1609, and more specifically, of course, the publication of Four Centuries of Dutch-American Relations, 1609 to 2009, co-edited by, co by Professor Van Minnen and his colleagues, and written by a team of nearly 100 Dutch and American scholars. The book is really the first comprehensive history of this bilateral relationship, as it evolved from the first exploratory contacts in the early 17th century to the multifaceted exchanges in the early 21st century. It is close I believe to 1,200 pages long, and I'm sure it will be a rich resource uh, for future generations of researchers uh, interested in this very special relationship. <coughs> Following opening remarks by Ambassador Jones Boss, the three co editors will highlight some of the findings from this uh, heavy volume, uh, and then Ambassador Bremer has graciously agreed to provide some comments, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and comments by all of you. Since we have a rather <coughs> large panel and limited time, let me leave it at this. Uh, let me uh, uh, forego extensive introductions. There are um, introductions in the materials, the handout uh, made available to all of you outside. I'd like to, however, acknowledge the support uh, of this event uh, by the Netherland America Foundation, <coughs> the Roosevelt Study Center, and the Embassy of the Netherlands. Also grateful for Professor Gail Maddox. She is here with us, yes, there, mm -hmm. for, uh, uh, for inspiring much of this collaboration uh, that led to this event. And finally, my staff, Matt Starling and Timothy McDonald, for helping with the arrangements as well. And now I have the distinct privilege to give the floor to Ambassador Jones Boss for some opening remarks. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Christian. Um, thank you for hosting us here today. Thank all of you for being here for this special event. A special thanks to Ambassador <coughs> Bremer to have bothered to come all this way and not forget about uh, the Netherlands and uh, the good memories we have of him. He was an ambassador who made a great impact uh, and impression on the Netherlands when he was there. And wonderful to be here with the, the co-authors of this massive book. Um, I have been here exactly a year now. It was uh, the 17th of September, so a day uh, and a year ago that I presented my credentials to President Bush, then still president. And what a momentous year it has been. That same day, Lehman Brothers collapsed, leading to the biggest financial economic crisis that we have known since the, the Great Depression. Uh, there were momentous <coughs> elections here in the United States, leading to the first African-American president. Tremendous interest from the Netherlands. I've never seen so many groups of people just coming, wanting to be here to see what was happening. 
the inauguration on one of the coldest days uh, and I sat on top of Capitol Hill and if you look at the big, big Google map photo you just see a red hood and nothing of my face because <laughs> it was so incredibly cold. And then of course the new administration, the stream of visitors we've had exemplifying, exemplifying the close ties we have and culminating in uh, and, and in New York 400 celebrations uh, as, as Christian just said 400 years ago that the Dutch set foot on this continent and we had a very intense week last week in New York seven days our crown prince was there and Princess Maxima uh, to uh, celebrate uh, the relations between the United States and the Netherlands and if I look at the program I think that exemplified the scope and the breadth of that relationship there are the military uh, connection that we have very strongly from the first <coughs> uh, and our, our prince mentioned it at West Point as well where he was cheered by 4,000 cadets that the Dutch were the first to salute the American flag uh, after independence we were the first to give a loan uh, to the Americans during your war of independence it did take John Adams an awful lot of time because the Dutch were just as stingy then as they are now <laughs> But he managed to do it. So, you know, from the very first, uh, we were connected uh, through military ties. And now, of course, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the Americans in Afghanistan. <coughs> we have troops in the south. Not everybody in the U.S. knows that or realizes that. I, I often get the reaction when I say this, oh, I thought we were there alone and that actually the European allies are not very active there. But we are there. We are in the south. We have been there from the start. And we are also in one of the more difficult parts uh, of Afghanistan. And we work together in, in other areas of military cooperation. The Joint Strike Fighter comes to mind, uh, training that we do. So very close uh, military and security cooperation, very close political ties. Uh, I've seen Secretary Clinton uh, twice last week because she uh, appeared uh, at the celebrations. She received the Four Freedoms Award on Friday night. For the, for the fantastic work she has done uh, in promoting the Four Freedoms from the Roosevelt Foundation. Uh, and she just spoke about uh, the <coughs> efforts uh, of the United States uh, for the coming UN General Assembly and the close cooperation with other allies and countries. And uh, the Netherlands certainly is, is one of those in the UN, uh, uh, in the Human Rights Council that the, the United States are a member of again. But we also have very close economic ties. We're the third investor in this country, and the U.S. is the first investor in the Netherlands, thus creating jobs on both sides of the ocean. The extreme importance of keeping this investment and trade going. Certainly in times of crisis, protectionism is the worst way to go. We have very close uh, uh, cultural ties <coughs> uh, from you know, the old classic uh, 17th century Dutch masters, we opened an exhibition with the Milk Meisje, the Milkmaid of Vermeer, last week in New York. Beautiful exhibition. I can recommend it to all of you in the Metropolitan Museum. But we also unveiled a modern Dutch design pavilion in front of the Staten Island Ferry. Do go to New York and have a look. It's a, it's a, it's a fun, quirky building uh, showing this, the, the new spirit of Dutch design. And it's very close to Battery Park Gardens, which were uh, designed by Piet Oudolf, Dutch garden architect. We had a water seminar. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we uh, are now involved with New Orleans after Katrina to see what can be done to protect the coast against water. Uh, we had a financial seminar. The Dutch is one of the top ten, uh, the Netherlands is one of the top ten financial centers in the world. So in all those areas, we work very closely together. And all of that is linked, of course, uh, to our history. And that's why I think this book is such a fascinating book, because it starts with those earliest days, the Dutch settlements here, New Amsterdam, New Netherlands, the values that they brought, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, all seen in the context, of course, in the 17th century. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant was not the easiest of people, and if you look at the old prints uh, of New York, you see very prominently in front of the print is a big gallows. So uh, it was not a soft society, but in terms of the 17th century, it was a society where uh, those freedoms were cherished and where city rights were uh, respected, and if they weren't respected, they were fought for. So just by way of introduction, uh, if I look back at this year, uh, I have the feeling so much has happened, I could almost fill a 1,200 pages as well. <laughs> uh, but I have still, uh, uh, I hope, at least three more years to go, so let's reserve judgment. But I'm impressed by the 
the intensity of our relationship, the depth of our relationship, the width of our relationship, the, the way that the Americans and the Dutch get mm -hmm. on together, uh, the way we often think uh, alike about things, and of course there's also things that we think about differently, and I'm sure during the panel discussion there will be opportunities uh, to, discuss, to discuss those areas as well. So thank you to, uh, once more to the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center for this great initiative, and compliments to the author. I think if you look to the future, it's always very, know, uh, very good to know exactly what did <coughs> happen in the past, and through this, um, through this volume, I think we will have that comprehensive overview. So well done. And looking forward to your questions later on. Thank you. Professor Van Minnen? Yes. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and um, I'm very pleased that we uh, could organize this event in cooperation with the Netherlands Embassy and the Netherlands America Foundation, the Washington chapter in particular. Uh, I'm also very honored that Ambassador Bremer and um, Ambassador Jones both uh, have uh, so graciously accepted our invitation to participate in this meeting. Well, um, the, the uh, meeting was uh, and has been advertised as U.S. Dutch relations in the post-1945 era, and we will certainly go into that, certainly my two co-editors will do this, but I thought having just produced this book uh, covering four centuries of Dutch-American relations, I really need to say a few words about the era before 1945. So um, I'll take a couple of minutes to, to uh, tell you something about it, some aspects, and then my colleagues will take over to the, to the present time. When the United States and the Dutch Republic established diplomatic relations in 1782, expectations were high. The United States not only needed uh, recognition as a new nation, but even more needed Dutch loans. And in securing these, John Adams, the first U.S. diplomat to the Dutch Republic and later the second president, was successful, And although he described the Dutch bankers as a shoal of sharks. So, um, <laughs> Dutch merchants hoped the American markets would bring new prosper prosperity. But during the 19th century, import tariffs in both countries prevented a flourishing trade relationship. Also, both countries were focusing on their internal development, the U.S. on its continental expansion and the Netherlands on its own political development and, ma and mainly on its uh, colony, the Netherlands East Indies. In his instructions to the first U.S. envoy to the Netherlands after the Napoleonic era, Secretary of State James Monroe underlined the friendly relations between both countries and considered The Hague as an important listening post, which he described as, quote, a principal theater of the most important negotiations in Europe for more than a century past and promised to become, again, a very inter interesting one in many circumstances. But as both countries had a foreign policy of aloofness and neutrality, there was hardly any political work to do for the diplomats in each other's country, and subsequently, in their reports, they mostly became observers of another culture. In general, one can say that the U.S. and Dutch diplomats in the 19th century reported with a strong bias. The American diplomats praised the democratic and republican system of their own country and criticized the shortcomings of the European system of monarchy and aristocracy. Whereas the Dutch diplomats, usually with an aristocratic background and very conservative, <laughs> abhorred the American system of mass democracy and never felt at home in the new world. After a few years, the diplomats from both sides usually were glad they could return home. During the early decades of the 20th century, the period of the world wars, as we have called it in our book, uh, only very, very few Dutch people realized that the United States was going to play a major role on the world stage. Symptomatic of this situation was the limited interest among Dutch career diplomats in an appointment at the Washington legation, which they perceived as very unattractive and a very expensive post. Around 1920, the Dutch government almost had to back potential candidates to accept the position in Washington. 
That has changed, I believe. <laughs> um, conservative and aristocratic diplomats uh, at the Washington legation in the 1930s had no sympathy at all for the United States and profoundly disliked Roosevelt's New Deal policy, which they considered a form of state socialism that should not serve as an example to the Netherlands. It was only during World War II that an increasing number of Dutchmen began to realize that for its democratic survival, the Netherlands had become dependent on the United States. And subsequently, in 1942, the Dutch legation in Washington was upgraded to the rank of embassy. Of course, during the interwar years, there were a number of Dutch, Dutch travelers to the United States who were interested in the country and who realized the increasing importance of the U.S. and also who published their observations in books and articles. But these, travel, these travelers, mostly intellectuals, were few in numbers and often skeptical about American mass culture and materialism. They thought European culture was far superior to what they saw in the United States. Dutch newspapers and periodicals in this era only occasionally published articles on the United States. So if the United States before World War II was a faraway country for the Dutch, did the Netherlands have any cultural presence in the United States? In other words, were there any persons and or organizations who made any effort to explain the Netherlands and its history and culture to an American audience? Yes, there were, and I want to mention two organizations. First, established in 1885, the Holland Society of New York continued to perpetuate the memory of the Dutch West India Company colony of New Netherland and organized a wide range of activities for the descendants of the New Netherland colonists. Second, in 1921, the Netherland America Foundation was founded. The objective of the NAF was and is to advance educational, literary, artistic, scientific, historical and cultural relationships between the two countries and to work toward, toward mutual understanding. And I'm glad the NAF, the Netherlands America Foundation, is a co-sponsor of this, uh, this meeting. I want to mention four Dutch Americans who are, uh, are to be credited for their efforts to put the Netherlands on the mental map of their fellow Americans. Proud of his Dutch roots, President Franklin Roosevelt was a member of the Holland Society since 1910, and he was also, ac also active in the Netherlands America Foundation. From 1921, through his election as President of the U.S. in 1932, he served as the NAF's Vice President. FDR, as you may know, was especially interested in the Dutch colonial architecture and during his presidency he saw to it that the Dutch architectural style and the construction material of fieldstone were not only used to build post offices in Hyde Park, Poughkeepsie and Rhinebeck in New York State, but also for his retreat, Top Cottage and the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library as well. Two other active Dutch Americans reaching out to the American public were the NAF's first president from 1921 to 1924, Edward Buck. He, was, he made a name in the United States as the editor of the Ladies' Home Journal. And the other person, Adrian Barnau, was the Columbia uh, University Queen Wilhelmina professor in Dutch language, literature and history. And he, he also did a lot to put the Netherlands uh, on, on the map. The popular historian, journalist and radio commentator Hendrik Willem van Loon was the fourth Dutch American on this list. Through his numerous publications, his books, his articles, he wanted to make the Americans, as he put it, Dutch conscious. Upon his death in 1944, the London Times wrote that Van Loon was, quote, one of the most engaging products of the marriage between Holland and the United States, end quote. Indeed, for many Americans in the 1920s through 40s, Hendrik Willem van Loon and the Netherlands were synonymous. Now, I want now, uh, do now want to give the floor to uh, my co-editors um, to discuss the post-1945 era, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to say a few uh, words about uh, the era before uh, 1945. So, I give the floor to yep. Hans. Thank you, Kees. <clears throat> As you notice, there's quite a different a contrast between the jubilant uh, perspective of, the, of Ambassador Post Jones and uh, the quietness of the 19th century. Mm. Something has happened in between, and that's the focus of my talk. Mm. Kees Vermina left us with a view of America from the Netherlands at a considerable distance from Holland. 
with serious doubts among the Dutch elite whether American culture possessed anything to be desired. Sixty years later, the situation is almost unimaginable. After World War II, these attitudes would radically change, uh, especially at the Dutch side. The end of the war was celebrated as an American accomplishment, even though few American soldiers had engaged in combat on Dutch soil. But a general feeling of gratitude for the American victory left a lasting legacy of goodwill. As peace returned, <coughs> Dutch destitution contrasted deeply with American prosperity. Americans were envied, and when they promised that the Dutch could be like them, the Hollanders readily believed them. The funds, and especially production measures of the Marshall Aid Plan, enabled the Dutch to ascend on the ladder of material progress. One might think that the intensity of transatlantic relationship after the war was predominantly a government affair. The political situation of the Cold War <coughs> spurred both governments to actively seek a close cooperation. The threat of communism and the loss of the Dutch colonial empire in the East cemented this new transatlantic relationship. But it was not only a relationship between two states. Private actors also contributed to the relationship. Uh, the cultural section of our book offers rich material, albeit that it offers a Dutch rather than an American perspective, as uh, Case just gave some examples of that. And it's not difficult to find other examples of the cultural avant-garde artists such as Piet Mondrian and Willem de Koning, <coughs> who led the way, who first felt the pull of New York already before the Second World War. They settled there and awakened the interest of their American colleagues. And in their wake, Dutch museum directors explored the value of modern American art. But only in the 1960s did these cultural connections grow strong. Dutch culture needed to become more democratic before it could widely engage American culture. And of course, this process of democratization was also partly inspired by American examples. It needed a complete economic recovery of the Netherlands and the incorporation of the Dutch into the global economic networks to create good conditions. Only after Holland had been rebuilt and prosperity had returned could the middle classes <coughs> afford buying American consumer products. Dutch families in the 1950s reached the consumption level of American families in the 1920s. But the result was a multiplier effect. Thanks to the introduction of a cheap tourist class in the late 1950s, thanks to tens of thousands of Dutch, uh, of tens of thousands of Dutch tourists could personally visit the United States and report. In addition, thousands of returning immigrants solidified their bonds and created first-hand experiences with American culture. The introduction <coughs> of television in the Netherlands in the late 1950s added to a positive visual image of America. And American business methods offered attractive alternatives for traditional meth methods. Academics at Dutch universities discovered the American social sciences to find solutions for modern social problems. And all this resulted in a climax in the admiration for all things American in the 1960s. And then things began to change. The rising level of education and a more independent mindset <coughs> sometimes turned against American trends. America provided also the means and the models to challenge the old authorities. New political parties in the Holland emulated direct democracy but mass protest movements also rooted in the Netherlands, as Ambassador Bremer might remember. <laughs> but even anti-American criticism had an American flavor. Left and right in Dutch politics simultaneously embraced and rejected America. The right supported US foreign policy while criticizing its lowbrow cultural imperialism. The left appreciate, appreciated its liberal American cultural expressions while fighting its foreign policy. This meant that whatever the debate, American examples were used. And this 
intensified the United States as a point of reference, whether negative or positive. And this role of America continued, has continued to grow. Also after America lost its singular status as the, in a rapidly global, globalize, globalizing culture. So economic changes and a culture of democracy were the conditions needed for a strong private contribution that intensified Dutch-American bonds. And history shows, and I encourage you to read the chapters about culture that I just summarized, history shows that unpredictable new connections were made. Dutch dancers jumped on American stages. Bands scored number one hits. American preachers filled prominent pulpits in the Netherlands. And films stirred discussion. And a balanced overview of similarities and differences, as we try to present in this book, helps to support these independent voices in entering the debate, which might otherwise be dominated by the strongest institutions, among them the state. So for a healthy bilateral relationship, cultural exchanges are indispensable. Jels. Thank you, Hans. I have um, just one or two pictures uh, as backdrop to what I'd like to say. I'd like to bring the talk right up to the current day uh, and have some, uh, some comments on um, where American-Dutch relations are perhaps going in the future, and particularly in the security and economic area. Um, now, the Netherlands occupies a, a paradoxical position in U.S. political consciousness. If it does get picked up in the foreign policy field, it usually has quite a good brand name in terms of international law, human rights, and free trade. Um, and in fact, the Newsweek Washington Post Global Power Barometer in 2005 placed the Netherlands as 10th in the world in terms of its impact, uh, and they based this on a kind of trawling through how events and countries <coughs> are portrayed in the, in the mass media. Yet this contrasts with the severe polarization in U.S. responses to its domestic policies. And oh, that's the one I want, sorry. Um, the conservative media, of course, tirelessly uses the Dutch as the image of all that is evil, uh, legal prostitution, decriminalization of soft drugs, euthanasia, as if it's like some kind of worst case scenario from the 1960s. While liberals look at it as a shining example of tolerance and restraint on the other side. So while Dutch forces follow through on NATO strategy to destroy opium fields in Afghanistan, U.S. conservatives pillory The Hague for allowing the narcotics underworld to take over large parts of Dutch society. Multiculturalism was once a key word, but Dutch immigration and integration policies have come under fire for leading to a divided society lacking in symbols of unity with potentially negative consequences for transatlantic security. For a small country, it seems to get noticed, for better or worse. Now, like I said, I'd like to concentrate on two aspects of Dutch-American relations here, uh, firstly on security policy. Now, when the American researcher Robert Russell asked a Dutch foreign affairs official in 1969 what the Netherlands' position in the world was, the reply came, the Dutch have no foreign policy, we have only NATO. Now, the 60s are renowned for being the high point of Dutch Atlanticism, the time when, come what may, the Dutch stood ne next to the United States in the transatlantic alliance. This wasn't accepted by everybody. There was criticism from the left, from the anti-nuclear movement, and from certain church groups for that reason, but the NATO line held, even though there was much debate. What is the situation now? Well, with the Cold War long gone, the Netherlands is effectively surpassing its own loyal ally image of the 1960s. Since the Yugoslav experience in post-Yugoslavia experience in Srebrenica and Kosovo in the 1990s, the Dutch military have been determined to become interoperable with and match the standards of US forces, to become members of this special NATO club alongside the British, Canadians, sometimes the Danes and the Australians as honorary members. There is effectively no EU or UN alternative. Dutch security planning for the future fits this scenario. So do acquisitions. The Joint Strike Fighter, as Ambassador Jones Boss mentioned quite rightly, still many years from completion and triple its original budget, was always going to be chosen by The Hague in place of the already functioning Eurofighter, never mind a Swedish Saab. The Dutch government has recently announced severe cutbacks in public spending in 2011, up to 20% in some areas, as a result of the 30 billion euro deficit in the budget following the banking crisis. And I just want to on another slide. Whether this will have an impact on Ministry of Defence planning remains to be seen. Now, it's interesting, going back to the point in the 60s, that there was this uh, debate about NATO 
you know, views coming in from particular parts of the political spectrum. If you look at the Dutch political scene now, it's completely absent. Uh, the Socialist Party, formerly anti-NATO, has retreated to backing a debate over NATO's possible global role as a security prov provider. <coughs> On the other side of the political spectrum, the right-wing Partei van der Freiheid, deeply nationalist party currently polling, polling to win over 20 seats in the next elections, insists that Dutch forces will only take part in NATO peacekeeping operations in the future, alongside full support for promoting human rights and a global counter-terrorism campaign. In other words, in, this, in these circumstances, it's highly unlikely that the Dutch mission in Afghanistan will end in 2011. Second part, uh, public diplomacy and economics. In an interview in the influential NSA Handelsblatt on 7th September, the new U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands, Faye Hartog Levin, indicated that public diplomacy, the use of various media outlets and channels to influence public opinion in other countries, will be high on her agenda. She gave particular attention to passing on the U.S. experience and integration and assimilation with minority youth in Dutch cities, in doing so also improving the image of the U.S. among these more marginalized groups. Now, I must say former amb U.S. ambassadors in The Hague have also dedicated much of their time to public diplomacy activities. Here we see Ambassador Bremer receiving a copy of uh, Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd just like to use this uh, moment to illustrate what the impact that n the Netherlands can have on people. Um, here we see Ambassador Bremer uh, arriving at uh, Schiphol Airport to take up his post. Mm. And uh, several months later, here we have the impact. Uh, so the, the stress is gone, and after several months in the Netherlands, uh, <laughs> everything, everything has become serene and, uh, and wonderful. It's all right, like in the 19th century. <laughs> right. Going the other way, uh, a recent report in the Dutch paper NSA um, noted that the Netherlands came in ninth in terms of how much money countries invest in lobbying and influencing public opinion in the United States. Four Dutch institutions distribute a total of $2.7 million in the United States. The Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, the Tourist Bureau, the Association of Insurers, and the City of Amsterdam. Now, partly the Amsterdam, uh, City of Amsterdam was to take on the negative image that Fox News portrayed of the city, but generally the emphasis here is very clear. It's defending the substantial uh, Dutch economic interests in the United States. The scale of U.S. Dutch investments is colossal. According to the uh, Department of Commerce's Bureau of Economic Analysis, Dutch FDI in the U.S. stood at $259 billion in 2008, equaling that of Japan, with only the U.K. having a higher figure. For the last 50 years, the Netherlands has also been a favorable, favorable location for U.S. investments coming into the EU. Not for nothing did President, uh, President Obama recently give his support for the Netherlands, becoming a permanent member of the G20 Economic Management Group. Now to conclude, to say the least, the centuries-old desire, Dutch desire for international order is now 100% focused on the United States. The rise of new economic and political powers such as China and India has attracted a lot of attention, and there is much talk of us entering an increasingly multipolar world. Dutch trade delegations regularly make their way eastwards as a result. Yet in an age of uncertainty, the overall effect is a heightened need to reinforce existing sources of order and leadership, and that means looking west and lining up alongside the USA. Likewise, from the US perspective, in an increasingly multipolar world, allies like the Netherlands, with their combination of soft and limited but effective hard power, will be of great value for the United States. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Bremer, who of course served in The Hague from 1983 to 1986. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador and colleagues from, uh, friends really, from Middleburg. Uh, I, I'd like to start by just uh, uh, complimenting the, ne the, uh, the Netherlands for its very strong dedication to the efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. I know these were difficult decisions for the respective governments in the Netherlands, and I certainly hope that uh, Professor Scott Smith is right that the Dutch will stay in Afghanistan after their current <coughs> Um, deployment is due to expire. They're playing a very important role in the b brigade level strength. Uh, they had a battalion in Iraq when I was there. They have a brigade level. They're in one of the most dangerous parts. They're now taking over command, I think, of the division in that area. And I, I commend them. It, it is a good example of the Dutch commitment uh, to the alliance. Uh, 
uh, I, when I arrived in the Netherlands, I'm going to do it, I was asked to do a little bit of sort of retrospective on how Dutch-American relations were in the case study of my three years there. Um, shortly after I arrived, the largest demonstration, public demonstration in European history uh, took place in The Hague. Uh, some 750,000 people, it still I think is the largest demonstration in European history, uh, paraded against uh, the American embassy uh, by implication at least against me. I was asked by my security people to stay home that day. My wife, uh, being a rather tough citizen, got on her bike and went down and patrolled back and forth. This, this demonstration took 10 hours to pass the American embassy. What were they upset about? They were upset about the question of deploying cruise missiles in the Netherlands. What was that about? Now, some of you will remember this, some of you don't. I'm going to give a little history. In the mid-1970s, the Russians suddenly deployed a group of middle-range SS-20 missiles in Eastern Europe, which threatened all of the capitals of NATO. Uh, it basically called into doubt and could threaten to upset the strategic balance between the United States and Europe, it challenged, in a way, the American commitment to defend NATO, and in effect, it threatened to upset the essential geopolitical post-war bargain, and that bargain was the United States would defend Europe, which would allow the Europeans to rebuild their economies after the war. That was the essential geopolitical bargain that really dominated East-West relations from 1945 until 1990. So this was a major thing the Russians had done. Under President Carter in 1978, the alliance took a decision called the two-track decision, which said that they would be willing to negotiate the withdrawal of these Russian SS-20 missions, missiles, but at the same time would proceed to deploy American cruise missiles, Pershing missiles, in five <coughs> NATO countries, including the Netherlands. This was the so-called two-track decision. The, by the time I arrived in the Netherlands in 1983, the negotiations, which had begun uh, under President Carter, had basically stalled out. Uh, although, and four of the five NATO countries had agreed to deploy the missiles as a result. The Dutch had not. The Dutch were the last holdout. And it was quite clear that the Soviet strategy was to stop the full implementation of the two-track decision. If they could do that, it could, first of all, call into doubt the one-for-all concept that underlies NATO, underlay NATO then and underlies NATO now. We're all in it together. And secondly, of course, it would decouple European security from American security by calling into doubt the question of whether the United States would in fact carry out its commitment to defend Europe. In other words, what had happened with the Soviets and what was going on with the deployment of these cruise missiles really had become a vital matter for American security policy and for Western security policy. It put the Netherlands right at the top of the list back here in Washington. Now, the Dutch, to, to now talk a bit about the challenge I faced, the Dutch public was split. It had been split, as Professor Scott Smith pointed out, since the war, since anyway the late 60s, in general terms, and it was split on this issue. The Labour Party, the Pevanda A, was opposed to deployment. The Liberal Party, the VVD, was in favor of deployment. The De and Sestig, which I think has since more or less disappeared, nobody knew what it's <laughs> growing again. Nobody knew what its position was. And as usual, there was a coalition government in the Netherlands. And the, to complicate matters further, the leader of the coalition government, which was the Christian Democratic Party, was itself split on the question of whether the Netherlands should allow the deployment of these missiles. And just to make it still more complicated, the Christian Democratic Party held the positions of Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, and Defense Minister. And those three men were split on the question of whether or not they should deploy missiles. So it was quite clear that the position, the eventual position, of the Christian Democratic Party was the key to whether the Dutch would go along and carry out their obligations to deploy the Pershing missiles. Now, as it happens, I succeeded a, an American ambassador who also understood the importance of this issue, but who pursued a very aggressive and open uh, diplomacy to try to push the deployment. He spoke often in public and very um, directly to the Dutch people about the importance. Before I left Washington, I 
read a lot of Dutch history, uh, I would say at least that many pages about Dutch history. And I went around and talked to all the former American ambassadors in the Netherlands and many non-government experts, including at places like, like the Wilson Center. And my conclusion was the Dutch people are a very honest people. They're very direct. As Ambassador Rene Boss pointed out, there is a, a real similarity in the way Dutch and Americans talk about and talk to each other, something that's really quite remarkable. But I also concluded the Dutch are rather stubborn. They have an expression in the Netherlands that the Dutch have long toes, and it's very easy to step on those toes. And it's unpleasant for both the steppy and the stepper, I found. <laughs> So as I studied Dutch history before I left, I came across many of the things that have been talked about here, the 400 years, the first pilgrims, the establishment of New Nederland. As Crown Prince Willem Alexander said last week in New York at one of the celebrations, these men and women who came to the United States from the Netherlands, quote, brought a love of freedom and a spirit of entrepreneurship to America. Dutch banks, as the ambassador pointed out, gave us our first loans, which basically financed our revolution. As Barbara Tuckman's book pointed out, they made the first salute to the United States. Um, for years, our two countries had shared a commitment of deep value to free trade and an open liberal economy. And as was just mentioned, the United States had played an important role through the Marshall Plan in the reconstruction of the Netherlands. When I arrived in 1983, then, at that point, both the United States and the Netherlands were the single largest investors in each other's uh, countries. The Dutch was the largest investor here. We were the largest investor there. Our two-way trade was enormous. The Netherlands was the third largest recipient of American exports in the world, basically a tribute to the efficiency of the port of Rotterdam. Over a thousand American firms had their European headquarters in the Netherlands already in 1983. Cultural relations between the two countries had flourished uh, over the last half century. I found in my uh, travels around the Netherlands that the English language capability, as you've already heard this morning, of the Dutch is probably second to no other non-English speaking country in the world. Possible exception is Israel, although since the fall of the Soviet Union with the arrival of so many Jews from uh, the Soviet Union, I think now clearly the Dutch have the, the, the uh, best English language capability of any non-English speaking country in the world. And most strikingly, uh, the United States and the Netherlands, when I arrived then, and it's still true today, have the longest record of unbroken diplomatic relations between any two countries in the world. We're on the 227th year this year, as I'm sure Madam Rene Boss knows. Mm. So these factors, thinking back and talking to people, led me to my own two-track strategy to try to get the Dutch to say yes to the deployment. First of all, we would embark on a major public effort to draw on what I saw as a deep well of long-term goodwill between the Dutch and the American people. It was very important to counter a widespread impression, which basically grew out of the, I would say, naive dislike of President Reagan, that the United States was somehow dangerous. But just as an aside, in 1984, when we had our presidential election, a poll was conducted of the Dutch public. Would you vote for President Reagan or Senator Mondale? Dutch public voted 92% for Senator Mondale, who went on to carry one state in this country, just to remind those of you who don't remember. Um, as the book pointed out, the, uh, an important part of this public affairs strategy were a number of steps which I took as soon as I got there. One was to revitalize the Fulbright program. The Fulbright program had fallen into a situation where it w had become the plaything of, with all respect, the senior Dutch uh, academics. They were giving Fulbright uh, scholarships to their friends and rewarding each other. Mo I found the average age of the Fulbrighter coming from the Netherlands was 56, and if you read back, <laughs> If you read back to the original legislation, we were not supposed to be rewarding uh, people in the twilight of their careers. Similarly, I found the important visitor program, which is a very important part of American diplomacy still today, the IVP program, where young leaders are, are brought over to the United States. They can create their own program, go anywhere they want, three weeks, full, fully paid, go look at the United States. 
based on the uh, argument that the United States essentially sells itself. People come here, and if you give them a chance to uh, look around, they generally go back with a better uh, impression. I revived our information outreach. I promoted a much broader uh, program of American studies, including uh, creating the Johns Adams Chair of History uh, at the University of Amsterdam. I supported the Middleburg Foundation greatly, and I'm actually proud to say that one of the things I did was get the Middleburg Foundation to include the other Roosevelt mm -hmm. as part of its study. I noticed that you only mentioned one Roosevelt. He had a cousin who was also president and who also was the first American to win the Nobel Peace Prize, as I kept telling the Dutch. So Teddy Roosevelt is now part of the Middleburg mm -hmm. uh, study. Eleanor as well. And Eleanor. Mm -hmm. The objective of this whole process was, first of all, to persuade, to encourage the Dutch public to reflect on the deep and lasting ties of friendship between our two friendship and commerce between our two countries and use that as a the political basis to say to the Dutch politicians you can deploy these missiles because there is a, a foundation of understanding and support between the United States and the Netherlands and in contrast to my predecessor I decided there would be no public lecturing or even discussion in public of cruise missiles in my three years there, I probably did four or five hundred press events and interviews and discussions. I never once in public mentioned the cruise missiles. Never once. But to counter or to complement this major public uh, affairs program, we had a very intense uh, focus on a wide-ranging, broad, and relentless pressure in private on the Dutch politicians. And we had a pretty tough message. Our private message was this. First of all, the Netherlands had played a vital role in the foundation of post-war Europe. The coal and steel union, the common market, and so forth. Secondly, the Dutch had learned, it was passed over rather lightly here, but the Dutch had learned a lesson from neutrality, failed neutrality, in World War I and World War II. Like other members of what was called the Oslo Group, which was basically the Scandinavians and the Benelux countries, who felt after World War I that neutrality was the way to protect them in World War II, they learned, the Germans taught them pretty quickly, that that didn't work. And the Dutch were a founding member of NATO as a result. And had provided some of the most effective early leaders, particularly Josef Luntz, who was a longtime Secretary General. Thirdly, we would tell the Dutch politicians, you have earned the uh, reputation as a serious, thoughtful ally. Every time major issues come up, you Dutch, being Dutch, take it seriously. You study the matter, you think about it, you talk, God knows, a lot about it, and you have, generally speaking, come to the right decisions. Thirdly, Dutch and alliance security, Dutch and alliance security are threatened by the SS-20s. By the way, the peace movement and the Russians uh, I think encouraged by the Russians, put around the story that there were no SS-20s or that we had the wrong numbers. And one of the things we had to do was, and it was quite a struggle, get, I had to get our intelligence community to agree to bring clear documentation, which meant photographs of the SS-20s and their locations and show them on a classified basis to the top Dutch uh, politicians. Next, we would tell the Dutch leaders, NATO unity and security would be gravely damaged by a Dutch decision to say no on the cruise missiles because it would in fact split the alliance. And finally we had to tell the Dutch, and that was the hard part, a Dutch no will have a significant negative impact on your role in NATO and on your relations with the United States. And the Dutch had played an important role, just as an aside, in the NATO organization called the NPG, the Nuclear Planning Group, they weren't going to be able to have that anymore if they didn't take these missiles. It was a pretty tough message. Now, I mentioned briefly getting the, we, we had other elements of the strategy in, in order to support this. I mentioned briefly getting the intelligence community to come over. We had a visit by Vice President, then Vice President Bush, who came and delivered this message in person. We had regular visits by the Dutch Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, and Defense Minister to Washington where they heard elements of these same messages in private from American uh, leaders. Success eventually came about through a series of secret negotiations with the Dutch foreign minister, Hans van der Brugge, 
at the residence of the Dutch ambassador in Brussels, where we brought people over from Washington, and both the foreign minister and I traveled secretly to Brussels, and we had discussions there. I have to say these were tough discussions, and I, I came to have a great deal of sympathy for John Adams when, when he <laughs> talked about how hard it had been in 1778 to get the Dutch banks to make the loan. I sometimes thought I would be there four centuries, you know, trying to get the Dutch to come along. Uh, in May of 1986, the efforts were um, uh, rewarded at about 2.30 in the morning one morning when the Dutch uh, parliament voted in favor of the deployment. And, of course, we never had to deploy these missiles in the end because of an agreement that President Reagan eventually uh, made with the Soviet Union. Now, there are a couple of lessons here, I think. One, uh, paying attention to the 400 years of U.S.-Dutch relations was important, and building a public affairs strategy on that uh, played a very important role in, uh, if you will, smoothing the way for the Dutch leaders to make what was a very difficult uh, decision. Secondly, alliance steadfastness paid off. And thirdly, steady American, firm American commitment to carrying out this decision was extremely important. I must say, I didn't expect when I was invited to uh, speak here some weeks ago that the question of deployment of missiles in Europe would suddenly become uh, important again, but it has. Uh, and uh, we now see some of, uh, somewhat of a replay of some of the problems uh, that we were faced in the cruise missile debate in the Netherlands uh, 25 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bremer. We have about half an hour for questions and comments. If you could please, in Wilson Center tradition, identify yourself and also please wait for the microphone so that <clears throat> Uh, folks watching us over the live, live webcast can understand you as well. Yes. I'm, I'm Howard Wiarda, which some of you may recognize as a Dutch Frisian name. Yeah. Um, and my question is addressed to the ambassador, actually. And I'd like to ask you this. We have noticed in this city that many ambassadors from abroad, uh, as part of their strategy, are now reaching out to their ethnic communities in various parts of, of the United States. So the Portuguese ambassador goes up to Connecticut and Rhode Island, where there's a large Portuguese community and so on. And so I'd like to ask you if you are also doing that, uh, first of all, beyond the Hudson River. <laughs> uh, let's say, to the Dutch communities in Michigan and Wisconsin and Iowa and North Dakota and Washington State. And secondly, um, since those communities are quite different from uh, the Netherlands, culturally and religiously mm -hmm. uh, at this stage, what kind of reaction would you get if you go out to these ethnic communities in this country? Thank you very much. Uh, leaving the Hudson River aside seems hard to do after last week, but uh, I'll try. Um, I think um, two things I'd like to say about it. One, there's a lot of Dutch people here, or people of Dutch uh, background, who do not feel necessarily that they're part still of a Dutch community. So I have the feeling that a lot of Dutch Americans have really fully integrated in Dutch society and do not necessarily stick together with their own uh, former compatriots. Um, General Petraeus, for example, is of Dutch background, but nobody knows it, and I don't think he makes a big deal of it, and I don't think he just sticks to, uh, to, to his Dutch groups. Um, so I think maybe the Dutch in that sense are a little bit different, but I'd like to hear from you if you, if you share that, uh, that assessment from maybe the Lithuanians or the Poles or the Irish, who very much tend to stick together and maybe cherish uh, uh, that background and, and uh, that heritage. <coughs> On the other hand, there are groups, as you rightly said, in Michigan and Iowa. And I have been in Michigan uh, for the Tulip Festival, the annual Tulip Festival, and I thought that was an absolutely fantastic event. 
uh, first of all arriving in Grand Rapids and, and going, I was helicoptered by a gentleman called J.C. Huizinga uh, to uh, Holland and Zealand and Drenthe and all the places you have there. So it really feels as if you're back home and everybody is called Hoekstra and Joustra and uh, all Dutch names, but they don't speak a word of Dutch anymore. So it's a very interesting, uh, interesting experience. Uh, the tulips are everywhere. They, uh, the, the festival is uh, like a, a spring ritual. Uh, all the aldermen and, and the mayor of the city walk around in wooden shoes and clogs, and they have brooms in their hands to sweep the streets clean, uh, like in the best Dutch spring cleaning tradition. Uh, but I still think they strongly feel the tie. You have colleges like Hope College, Calvin College. They have uh, ties with uh, with uh, the Roosevelt Institute, amongst others, but also with uh, the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. Uh, so uh, I have not yet uh, visited all of the Dutch communities, but I intend to do so in my next years here. Uh, I think it's good to to keep to cherish those ties, and it, it gives an extra dimension uh, to the relationship. It gives an extra entry into different groups of the population. And, uh, and it's also fun uh, to, to, to keep those traditions going. So I encourage you all to go to the Tulip Festival in Michigan. And when I've been to Iowa next year, mm -hmm. I'll tell you more about that one, too. Thank you. Holland, Michigan, and Hope College. Excellent. Would I have your uh, two photographs of Would, Hold on, hold on, hold on, please. Uh, the, the microphone, otherwise please. our audience out there will miss this. Uh, I apologize for uh, uh, that slight outburst, but a uh, certain amount of <laughs> uh, Dutch pride here. Uh, uh, we were very happy to have Her Excellency uh, the Ambassador in Holland, Michigan in May, and uh, uh, I have uh, with me two photographs of her and uh, her husband, Dr. Jones, uh, riding in a, um, an open convertible in the parade and looking very happy uh, mm -hmm. doing so. And uh, she made a tremendous impact. Uh, on people in Holland, Michigan. She's doing a superb job mm -hmm. in representing the Netherlands and building uh, the relations. And I just want to express uh, my personal and our community's deep appreciation for all that you're doing uh, to build uh, and strengthen these relationships. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, the the uh, Dutch heritage of uh, tolerance is unexcelled in the world and going back before the Pilgrims and Spinoza. And I was wondering, is that uh, historically a consequence of, uh, of the maritime culture of so many different uh, cultures and peoples uh, mingling in Amsterdam or the fight against uh, Spanish autocracy or uh, the Protestant heritage? If you if you could identify yourself, sir. Uh, oh, no. Uh, David Harris, a uh, retired academic. Okay, thank you, <laughs> gentlemen. Shall I try? Um, as historians, we uh, we now and then have some um, reservations uh, when tolerance is so much put uh, as a virtue that we export it and plant it here in the United States. Uh, uh, you already gave part of the answer yourself, that it was more like an, a matter of convenience and of uh, rationality to allow at, at least some uh, leverage and some uh, broadness and some acceptance in, in the low countries. Uh, if you look at um, what's what happened here in the United States, uh, was tolerance something that we exported? You see that, that, uh, that uh, the tolerant uh, attitude was already present in New Amsterdam because it was uh, so, so diverse. So you needed to allow some uh, some uh, room for other groups. But only half of the population of New Amsterdam was uh, from the Netherlands, from the Low Countries, I should say. So there was a lot of uh, uh, foreigners in in that in that society. And what the tension was is to uh, to create um, enough homogeneity to keep the society together. And that was the other part that, that and uh, somebody mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned Peter Stuyvesant had some an, an role to play in order to, uh, to strengthen the homogeneous part of that. And both th things you see uh, happening in the Netherlands, and it's also part of our present uh, debate, whether we hang together enough 
and whether we're tolerant enough. So, uh, in answering your question, you should look at both sides of that uh, of that uh, equation. May I uh, may I add a few words? Well, uh, there's also this commercial aspect to the tolerance. Uh, it was also advantageous, so to speak. And with the, the Dutch, as a, as a small group who settled in New Amsterdam, and as, as Hans just said, with people from other regions also settling there, well, the way to continue to do business was to be tolerant to, to other religions. Um, but it was not always the case in reality, like Peter Stuyvesant was not that tolerant. Um, um, in Amsterdam, the same situation, old Amsterdam, so to speak, that um, there were these many religions. Yeah, there were people uh, during the Spanish uh, the war with Spain who fled Antwerp and who settled in Amsterdam, and of course, who were uh, Roman Catholic. Um, and as long as it was not too official, it was tolerated. Um, but uh, commerce, well, as John Adams, we, we referred to him a couple of times, he talked about the sharks. And as long as the sharks were being fed, it was OK with tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> I, uh, my name is Onno de Beaufort Weinolds. I'm a former Dutch executive director in the IMF and following that um, representative of the European Central Bank in Washington. I'm now a permanent resident of Washington, a fantastic city, I must say, and uh, gives the opportunity to come to all these wonderful uh, events. I um, <clears throat> very much enjoyed the historical perspective of our great relationship over centuries. History is prologue. And I want to just cast a little forward. We heard about yesterday, today by the ambassador, and what about tomorrow? I think that's fascinating to see how our relations are going to develop. And the ambassador, of course, after her stay in Washington, is going to write the next tome. <laughs> she has already <laughs> promised it, more or less, so we're looking forward to that. Um, but uh, we, we saw that military and politically, we are maybe closer than ever. Uh, and I see a continuation of that trend, personally. but. Uh, be happy to listen to other uh, views. But I want to focus as an economist a little bit on the economic and social aspects of our relationship. I think uh, in the post-war period there were considerable divergences in that area. I, I remember when we had in the 70s Prime Minister Den Oil, Holland had in my view become a totally socialist country with redistribution of income, um, all sorts of uh, welfare state enhancements whereas the United States system was very different. And mm -hmm. some would say it was uh, laissez-faire capitalism or even cowboy capitalism. Uh, do you agree that this is no longer the case, that we have converged and we will continue to converge probably? Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think, and I don't want to get political, but with the change of administration here, I think that we will see closer convergence of our economic and monetary policies. And I'm thinking also of <clears throat> The fact that in Holland already starting in earlier decades, we uh, cut back our bloated welfare state somewhat, and we made our labor market more flexible, things like that, where the American example helped us, certainly. At the same time, I think that we now see a movement in the United States towards more social um, policies, and this administration is a good example. Health care for pretty much everyone, um, tax policy that is more, um, well, geared towards uh, equity, equity and so on. So I'd like to hear from the panel how they see our future and whether they, uh, in our relationship, whether they agree that there might be a further convergence. Thank you. Ambassador? <laughs> Take first. Thank you for letting me go first. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Um, I see a couple of things. Um, first of all, I still think if you look at relationships that are underpinned by shared values, the United States and Europe are still very close. So if you look at how we go about solving the problems of the world, whether they are political, or economic, or social, I think that the United States and Europe still are very close partners in doing so. and and. I really see that with this present administration, uh, you see Secretary Clinton, also President Obama repeating uh, 
The United States cannot do it alone. We need to work in partnerships. We need to work together with other nations. I think uh, the G20 is a good illustration of that as well. Uh, we had uh, this enormous financial and economic crisis, and it was President Bush in the, the last month of his term who called the G20 together. And yes, we did fight very hard to be part of that because we thought we belonged in that uh, group of countries. So we're happy we were reinvited again. And in the G20, agreements were made on how to approach this crisis, what to do in terms of stimulus, what to do in terms of financial regulation. Now, I don't think it will work out in exactly the same way in practice in Europe and in America because our societies are still different. What I really notice here is the allergic re uh, reaction that most Americans have to a bigger role of government, whereas we think the role of government is here relatively small if you compare it to the one in Europe. And Europeans expect governments to solve issues because, well, that's what we pay taxes for. So there still is, I think, the difference in looking at the role of the state. Uh, another difference, I think, compared to, to maybe 20, 30 years ago, the times of the Cold War, is that there are so more players on the international stage that are of importance uh, to the U.S. So I don't think there is such an exclusive relationship anymore. In the Cold War, of course, Europe and the United States worked very closely together because we were the closest allies in the world. And if you look at the economic situation, for example, China is very important for the U.S. China, I think, owns uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of the United States economy, if you would look at it like that. Russia is very important to pursue some of the foreign policy goals. Uh, think about uh, Iran, the sanctions, the role in the Security Council. Uh, India, Brazil, you have those upcoming uh, countries that are also fighting for a bigger share in the IMF, uh, and that's why the G20 is important. So I think if you look at values and if you look at how we look at the world, Europe and, and particularly also the Netherlands and the U.S. will stay the closest of partners. But I do think there's more competition out there. And uh, I do think there's, there's, there's a more complex world now than there was during the Cold War time. Thank you. Ambassador Bremer? Yeah, uh, a couple of points. First of all, I'm also a trained historian, and I, I get a little uneasy with uh, straight-line projections into the future. Um, I've heard this argument about convergence now going on for about 40 years, and it, it alternates with the argument that we're not converging. So it depends on when you take the picture. I think it is true, as the ambassador has said, that there is a fundamental difference still between the United States and Europe on the role of the state, uh, the appropriate role of the state, not just in economics but in the political life of the country. That, that is true, even though we have shared values. Um, and, but I think there is, um, there is a question as well about the nature of the state. And here I think it's quite different in Europe, in particular countries, and, and I would ar argue also the Netherlands. I mean, what, is, what does it mean uh, to be a citizen of the Netherlands? You know, we in America pretty much know what it means to be an American. You know, we may get to a point 50 years from now where we're asking the same questions that are being asked in Europe. But with the very high uh, density of immigrate, immigrants, immigrant populations in countries, particularly in France, for example, where it's almost 15 percent, I think the Netherlands is less, five or six, seven percent, something. And these immigrants are not coming from um, the same cultural background as the Dutch. What does it mean to be a Dutchman? Do you have to speak Dutch? Do you have to read Dutch? Can you subject yourself to a different kind of law, as has been proposed by some Muslims in the United Kingdom? Um, these are questions which were danced over here this morning, but which are really very fundamental right now in the Netherlands to the debate about the politics. And I think if you look I mean, the Netherlands, I have more confidence, will get through this because of its history of tolerance and so forth and its ability to address hard questions. I have less confidence about some of the other countries, major countries in Europe, being able to address this, particularly when you look at demography. Demography is king. There, there are three, you know, you can't change history, you can't change geography, and if you add demography into the mix, you've really got a pretty good way of knowing where the future is going. No European country is at replacement levels of population growth. None, including the very Catholic countries of Italy and Poland. They're all below, which means their populations are all 
basically declining. This is the fundamental thing that is going to change Europe in the next 50 years. It's the fundamental challenge the Europeans have because they have built out these very elaborate welfare states that are based on much higher levels of taxes than we have in this country, much a greater role for the, sta the, the state in the economy, as the ambassador mentioned. And on what basis in the year 2050 will they be able to continue those welfare states that they've built out really since the 1945, since the end of the war, uh, without either raising taxes to an unsupportable level or allowing levels of immigration, question mark, who are those immigrants, where are they coming from, and will they become Dutchmen or Frenchmen or not? And I think as a result of this, uh, I actually think that uh, I know this will not be popular with my colleagues here. I think th the, the fact of the matter is that from an American point of view, the geopolitical balance in the world is shifting rather rapidly to Asia. Europe is becoming relatively less important in a, to American foreign policy. It's not that it's unimportant. NATO is still our most important uh, alliance, although we have some pretty important alliances in Asia too. And the, as the balance shifts towards Asia, Europe will be less important to the United States. This doesn't address your question about convergence, but I do not take for granted that the, there will be convergence. I don't take it for granted. I am also quite a believer in what in business terms are called disruptive technologies. I call them disruptive events. 9-11 is the most obvious recent disruptive event. And I'm not sure how, I'm not at all sure that America and Europe would react the same way to future disruptive events like that. So a note of caution. Thank you. Have the other historians on the panel like to comment? Um, just very briefly uh, about Den Owl, about this high point of Dutch leftism, socialism, uh, communism. Um, the thing about Den Owl government was um, they were uh, determined to maintain close links with the Americans. The foreign minister was very strongly Atlanticist. Um, defense minister was very strong Atlanticist. Uh, there was the oil crisis in that period where the Dutch worked very closely with the Americans. So the point is that the, the social policies indeed may have diverged from the United States. Yeah, hugely, but that, the point is the alliance was rock solid yeah. and that, that was never in doubt. I mean, yeah, that's true, but it, uh, <laughs> just a minute, please. Because Denal's party, he was the Pevendal, he was a Labour Party, um, was dead set against the deployment of cruise missiles five years later from what we're talking about. So, yes, you are right, particularly in the crisis of 1973 when we had the Arab oil embargo, the Dutch stepped up before any and ahead of any of the other Europeans to support the United States in trying to break that embargo. Absolutely true, and that was under Denal. But uh, let's read the whole history of Denal, not just part of it. Yeah, fair Thank point. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes. Microphone. Thank you. I'm Leela Dane. I'm here because I couldn't get to New York last week. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a member of the Society of Daughters of Holland Dames, which means I can trace my heritage back to late 17th century Cornelis de Mellon, who, who was um, founder of Staten Island. Um, of course, I'd much rather have an, an intellectual discussion than sitting around looking at people uh, on the Hudson River. But uh, I'm very happy to be here and to hear this discussion especially. Uh, to me, uh, uh, my Dutch heritage uh, uh, is all about uh, the internationalism of Holland. Uh, I studied the Hanseatic League when I lived in Hamburg shortly after World War II, and uh, tolerance that comes from that, as we've discussed, but I consider that extremely important. I'm a traumatologist. I'm a clinical psychologist majoring in trauma, and um, there's a couple of Dutch traumatologists who are world famous and to me if we look at the future whether it's convergence or not it's about human rights trauma is about human rights and 
when we talk about Asia, I don't see Asia addressing issues of human rights the way mm, the Western world can if it lets itself. Uh, you have to go beyond hegemony for that. Um, so that's where I'll be looking at in the future, and I'd like to hear what the panel has to say about that. And I, I hope that uh, the leadership in, in Holland will not forget about these famous traumatologists you have. Thank you. Well, the leadership uh, certainly doesn't forget about human rights. Uh, for our present foreign minister, Minister Verhagen, uh, human rights is at the core of his foreign policy. And uh, we just had our speech from the throne, the annual um, kind of discussion of the new budget where the Queen reads out the speech and the ministers fill in the programs for the different ministries. And Minister Verhagen repeated that very strongly. It's at the core of our foreign policy. Um, and I think it is very strongly that also for the for the present administration, uh, Secretary Clinton just gave um, a speech at Brookings Institution about her um, um, her her um, direction for the upcoming United Nations General Assembly, and uh, issues of human rights and development, the rights of women, for example, uh, the fight against um, uh, uh, conflict is very strongly at the forefront. So I think that will stay. Uh, the problem is always how you implement it and how do you do that, for example, in relations with China, where you have a, a, a broad spectre of relationship. You have your economic interests, your financial interests. Uh, you need them on, your, on other foreign policy issues. But for us, it has never been either or. It always has been and and. So even with big countries like China and Russia, we have a, a huge economic inter interest in both of those countries as well. But has ne that has never stopped us from addressing human rights issues and supporting human rights activities, activists, uh, NGOs, uh, but also helping those countries build up the rule of law, for example, by building up uh, a legal structure. So, And I think that for the United States, uh, that will be the same. Thank you. Anybody else like to react on this issue of human rights? Well, <coughs> as historians, we are not always that good to predict the future, of course. So, um, good at predicting the past. Though. The past. <laughs> we can predict the past. Um, uh, well, I, I, uh, of course, the, 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 as the Ambassador Jones uh, just said, that in Minister Verhagen's policy, foreign policy, human rights is, is really uh, very, very important. But if we talk about, as Ambassador Bremer mentioned a moment ago, look into the future, let's say 50 years from now, well, with the demographic changes taking place in Western Europe, certainly, including the Netherlands, I would have my doubts too what, whether human rights would still be at the core of Dutch foreign policy. I don't know. Uh, but if you look at the demographic development in the Netherlands with, let's say, the, the four biggest uh, cities in the Netherlands having uh, more than 50, 55 percent of people from non-Western countries already, I don't know. I th this is a concern to me too, I must mm -hmm. say. Yes. Thank you. We're just about uh, out of time. Any final questions or comments? Yeah, one, okay, final question there and then we'll conclude. Henry Hetker, a researcher at NARA, retired federal government. I, I wondered about your feelings regarding the future of Western New Guinea. You know, the West Irian is suffering this illegal occupation, now more or less incorporated into Indonesia. Uh, what are your suggestions on this? Uh, is there any way to reduce the insurgency to have people work things out, or is it sort of hopeless, uh, like another Tibet? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let the ex-colonial power address that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're asking a very difficult question, but um, well, first of all, for the Netherlands, we uh, we accept the territorial integrity of Indonesia, so it means that we accept um, uh, that Indonesia is as it is now. Uh, we do think that the Indonesian government should um, uh, uh, recognize the rights of all the people living in Indonesia as a continuation to the question that was asked earlier, and that means that you give people the right of speech and the right of uh, the, the, the freedom of religion, 
that you give them food and education and shelter. Uh, so uh, it will remain um, uh, a difficult uh, area, I think, for the time being. But uh, our position is that within that and within that recognition, you try to talk to the government and work with the government uh, about how to change the situation for the better. Uh, if you. I can just add, sorry, um, the, there is a certain amount of um, uh, activism amongst the Papua community in the Netherlands and connections with certain civil rights <coughs> groups. It's very low-key, grassroots type activity, and I doubt whether it will ever expand beyond that. So there are certainly connections, but um, it's, it's, shall we say, staying off the political map largely, if that's answering your question. Thank you. Well, I think we've come to the end of our discussion. I think it's been a very rich panel. <coughs> Thanks uh, to, uh, in good measure, to uh, our uh, panelists. I'm very grateful to Ambassador Jones Boss, Ambassador Bremer, and our uh, three co-editors here. Uh, there are flyers um, provided by the uh, press outside uh, for you to order copies if you're interested. Thank you all for joining us here today for your questions and comments, and hopefully see you again soon here at the Wilson Center. Thank you. Thank you.